I love these podiums that are made for men. Can you see me? Good evening, and welcome to the Ford Hall Forum. For those of you who have never been to the Forum before, let me tell you a little bit about it. It is the oldest public affairs lecture series in the United States. It was begun in 1908, and people from all walks of life have been here. I can attest to that because my name is Susan Scher, and I'm a member of the Forum's Board of Directors. And in the time that I have been on the board, we have had everyone from Ted Turner to David Duke, Corazon Aquino, and well before my time, Margaret Sanger. The people in, on the Forum's board want to bring to you all kinds of thinkers, those on the cutting edge from all over the country, who represent different beliefs, whether they're economic, political, or religious differences, for the purpose of exploring issues of public concern, and as I said, those that are on the cutting edge. The Forum has never avoided controversy and truly embodies the best form of citizen debate. This is one of the only places where you will actually get to see someone in person and ask them questions. Now, the Forum has always been a nonprofit organization. Uh, unlike television, again, you will get to ask Patricia Smith questions. And unlike television, we don't have anyone who gives us money. The sole purpose of the Forum is to bring educational programs to the public completely free of charge. And because it is free of charge, when you leave tonight, you will be asked possibly to give us some money and to join the forum. The Fort Hall Forum has a long tradition of presenting speakers who are shaping the community in which we live. And tonight is a very special one of those speakers. This evening's featured speaker has been a journalist since childhood. Um, actually, probably you've come here because you've read Patricia Smith. Maybe you have heard her give um, poetry slam contest uh, presentations. So you think that you know her. But I'm going to tell you a few things about her to enliven her past. She began her writing career as early as the fifth grade by publishing a grade school gossip sheet in her hometown of Chicago. Following high school graduation, she enrolled in Southern Illinois University because she wanted to pursue a journalism career. But she was forced to take courses such as earth science and archaeology, which she didn't exactly deem journalistic, and so she decided to take a break, and she was hired as a typist for the Chicago Daily News. But she realized that she could learn more as a journalist by actually writing rather than typing, so she began pestering editors to give her an opportunity. And if you've read her, you know that pestering by Patricia Smith is probably nothing to scoff at. She was soon writing entertainment and music reviews for the newspaper, but the Daily News folded in 1978, and then she was hired as an entertainment writer for the Chicago Sun-Times, where she worked as a reporter for 12 years, winning a number of awards, including being named a finalist for the Pulitzer Prize. She came to Massachusetts in 1990, after being hired by the Boston Globe as an arts and entertainment critic. She later moved to the living arts section, where she focused on black culture. And during that time, she also appeared on the Metro, op-ed, and national pages. She covered a variety of issues, ranging from the Clinton inauguration to the Rodney King verdict. In May of 1994, just two years ago, Patricia Smith began writing a column, the first black woman in the history of the newspaper to do so. Besides being a reporter and a columnist, Patricia Smith is a published poet and playwright. She is author of Close to Death and Big Town's Big Talk. She has been awarded the Carl Sandburg Prize by the Friends of the Chicago Public Library and the prestigious Patterson Poetry Prize. Smith has read her works at the Poet Stage in Stockholm, the Sorbonne in Paris, Bahia 94 Music Festival in Brazil, and at a cultural arts fair in Osaka, Japan. She was one of five American poets to tour Germany, Austria, and Amsterdam. And currently, she's working on Bop Thunderous, a book of poems about South Africa to be published next year. Another one of her works, Life According to Motown, is a one-woman poetry theater production, and it has been directed by Nobel Prize winner Derek Walcott. It ran for eight sold-out performances in 1993 at Boston University's Playwright Theater, and later toured the Caribbean with Walcott's Trinidad Theater Workshop. She is also working on Charlie, a theatrical work about the infamous Charles Stewart case. Busy woman, and I bet she bakes her own bread. 
<laughs> Tonight, we are pleased to have Patricia Smith here to discuss Invisible Boston, facets of the city people never see. Ladies and gentlemen, it is my great pleasure to introduce to you Patricia Smith. Thank you. Did you say you better make my own bread? <laughs> oh, right. No, I don't. Oh, I couldn't. No. Uh, hi, everybody. How you doing? Everybody's good. Good to see you. Thanks for coming out in the rain. I was coming in, and so I always get this little thrill about seeing my name on things, you know, because I went so long without seeing my name on anything. And there's this little thing out front, you know, it says tonight. And so I'm out there, and I'm, I'm just kind of standing, savoring the two seconds, you know, before running in. And these kids come by and say, is it anybody? And the other one goes, no, it's not anybody. <laughs> I was thrilled. A little non-reading public, you know. But, you know, and I wanted to say, you know, if you buy a globe tomorrow, that's my scowling mug you'll see on the cover of the Metro front, but I didn't think it would impress them, so I didn't. Um, my job, it's a very visible position, and one of my favorite things to do is like, you know, ride the buses and trains. Well, it used to be my favorite thing to do is ride the buses and trains. Um, and look over people's shoulders as they read the column. You know, I try to read their minds and hope that they're thinking while they're reading. And one time a guy was reading it, and he kind of folded it up, and, and he was halfway through. You know, I saw he got halfway through, and he folded it up, and then I thought, oh, he's getting off the train. And he didn't get off the train, so I said, something made him stop reading. So I'm sitting there, and I go, Okay, so I went over and I said, was there something wrong with it? No introduction, no, what, is, what am I talking about? And he changed his seat and that was it. <laughs> um, I get a real thrill um, out of observing from the outside, watching people read what I've written, which isn't a very noble reason for getting into journalism, but that's, pr that's pretty much part of it. Uh, I began my career, um, as you heard, in the fifth grade, but that wasn't necessarily a fact that I wanted made public. I think the security staff at my old grade school is probably still looking for me. Um, what I did do, I did a mimeographed gossip rag. And, and this was kind of, you know, I had access to, and not a lot of people remember what a mimeograph machine is. Try doing this in the school and say mimeograph, and the kids are like, uh. Um, and the last time I was in Chicago, I was going through all my mother's, you know, I was thinking, I gotta have a copy of this here somewhere. And I think my mother's probably holding on to it in case I'm ever nominated for the Supreme Court or something. She can say, stop, stop the presses, look at this. Um, so this is what it sounded like, okay? So this was my first attempt at journalism. I only used initials because I didn't want anybody to know. So I would run these off on the mimeograph machine, leave them, I was a teacher's pet, really. So I would get there early and I would leave them outside classrooms so that people would pick them up as they came in. Mrs. M's fourth period class took a vote and decided that she shouldn't wear the yellow dress with the green flowers because the collar is dirty and it is starting to smell. And last week, she wore one brown shoe and one black one and thought nobody would notice because it was the same style shoe. But everybody saw. And Mrs. M should start, stop having lunch with Mr. D because nobody likes him, and if they see her with him, they will start not to like her either. Mr. R makes up tests that are harder than what he tells us to study so that we can all get bad grades because he is mean and mad because he has to wear bifocals and because he got caught with his zipper open one day in class. He was stretching a lot and writing things on the board, so all we got to see, oh, so we all got to see his underwear had hearts on them. T.E. says maybe that's where his heart is. M.Y. <laughs> got a good score on her test in Mrs. D's class because she cheated, because she had the answers written on the top of her gym shoe, and every time Mrs. D passed her desk, she put the other foot on top of it. The easiest class to cheat in is Mr. U's because he can't hear and hardly ever looks up from his desk. One time, O.T. took his book out and looked up all the answers sitting right in the middle of the room. T.W.'s mother needs to make her stop wearing those little baby doll dresses since she is growing a chest and the boys are all talking about it. This is, this is actual newspaper material. E.P. was a spy in the boys' gym and says that they all talk about whether or not the girls have big legs and if they have chests yet. They get all excited when they can tell a girl has a bra on. 
Uh, last thing. EP was a spy in the girls' locker room and says they talk about Davy Jones of the Monkees, but some girls talk about Peter Tork and the Jackson 5. HD says she knows Michael Jackson, but no one believes her because one time she got caught picking her nose and lied about it. <laughs> so when I was 10 years old, that was my, that was my idea of journalism. Uh, I would come in early and run these things off. I got a real kick out of watching people's reactions and of secretly knowing that I was the person to blame. I figured that the best journalism is someone writing what they know about. It would never do for me to write about sports or pep rallies or the earth-shattering decision to put another toilet in the faculty restroom. That wasn't around me and that wasn't what I was interested in. I was interested in writing about what I talked about. Unfortunately, the crack administration at my grade school was a lot smarter than they looked. It was terribly easy to find out who the budding newspaper magnet was. And I love the fact they sent a letter to my house saying, your daughter must stop breaking the rules. She must stop insisting on breaking the rules. I love that, you know. Um, it wasn't the first rule I broke, and to hear my editors tell it, it's not the last one. The conference organizers, Conference organizers have asked me to speak. They always are after me to come up with topics for speeches, and that's hard for me, because what I like to do is come in and look at faces of people and say, I think this is what they would like to hear about today. Um, but I will say, just in case you're being taught or you think that journalism is a structured and passionate unscrolling of the facts, I want to tell you not to listen, because journalism is about breaking the rules. And who taught me to break the rules? I'd have to say that that was my father. I can remember a lot of things about May 30th, 1978. It's odd how some days stick in your mind, refusing to go away no matter how hard you shake your head. I can remember what I was wearing, a beige short sleeve top, cream colored pants, and a gold belt. I was at work that day at my, as my job as a typist for the Chicago Sun-Times. And although I burned to be a reporter, I was still working my way up, and my job was to type in news copy from freelancers into the computer system. I can remember that that day was clear and sunny, hurting my eyes because it was almost too bright. I remember being surprised when an editor came over to say that my mother was downstairs. My mother, who came north in 1954, was always somewhat wary and in awe of white people and had never visited the newspaper. She had always been mystified at how I got a job working there and was so proud that sometimes she just sat me down in the mornings and smiled while I got dressed, preparing to go downtown to that gleaming big building where she said I'd better be good and mind myself and not give those white folks no trouble. After all, they were nice enough to give me that job and Lord knows they didn't have to. So on May 30th, 1978, when an editor walked over to my desk and said that my mother was waiting downstairs, I knew something was wrong. I imagined her getting dressed carefully, pulling Sears' best cinnamon stockings up her legs and hooking them, outlining her plump lips with color so that she could come downtown to that big gleaming building where her daughter worked and speak oh so carefully to the white people there. My mother had come to tell me that my father was dead. She'd never been a particularly warm person. She'd always had trouble expressing emotion. So I had only her wounded eyes to hold on to when she blurted out, Somebody killed your daddy last night. My mother and father had been separated so long that I had a hard time remembering that he was still her husband and that she must have been hurting as much as I was. She had taken me outside to tell me and the world started spinning. I remember walking to a bridge over a busy street and wondering how it would feel to jump, that all I had to do is jump and I could talk to my father again, see him and squeeze his arm and hear him laugh. My mother, who always had the uncanny ability to read my mind, must have known what I was thinking. She grabbed my shoulders and held tight while the traffic buzzed around us seductively. All I'd have to do is jump, I kept thinking. Just jump and I could die and at least have one more time to tell my father how much I loved him. When I was very small, my father used to read newspaper stories to me at bedtime instead of bedtime stories. And I really thought, I said, you know, Dad, I love you, but this is really strange. Um, and what, he, what happened because of that, I got fascinated with bylines. I was always wonder, who are these people who come into my community, 
Investigate a story that we're already all buzzing about, and the next day, just like magic, it would be in the paper, and they would have gotten information that we couldn't even get. So my love for newspapering started then. But my father was also very active in the union where he worked. He worked at a candy factory for 40 years. And he would take me to these union meetings, and there would always be these big, beefy guys with cigars going, hey, little lady, and they'd pick me up and scare me to death. Um, and afterwards, my father would have written a poem about these people, you know, this kind of nice, stilted, iambic pictometer thing. And we would share that in the evening as our kind of little special time. And all that time, I just thought, you know, I really have a great dad, and I didn't realize until after he was dead that my almost insane love for language and writing come from him. You know, that's one of the reasons that I write, and one of the reasons that I feel so strongly about what I write is because I can hear my dad in my ear telling me, you know, you can do this, and you can write, and you can write anything that you want. While my mother bowed her head to people, my father taught me to look them in the eye. In those union meetings, I saw him rage against wrong, speaking up in a voice that was clear and strong and determined. He taught me that speaking up, being sure within yourself, could change things. With a bullet, a murderer stopped my father, but they did not stop me. My father was not famous or notable or well-known. His obituary in the paper was a tiny one. The bullet stopped his heart, but he is standing before you today just as surely as I am. He is in me. He is driving my voice. It was he who wrote these words I say to you today. I am evidence that one man's influence can build a life. My father sparked in me a love of language, that, but also a respect for its power. If you're looking for someone to blame, he was the one who taught me to quit dreaming and start screaming. And now for my scream. Boston is a tiny city. It might not seem that way for those of you who come from really small towns where the convenience store, the auto garage, and the Baptist church are all housed in one building. But I come from the teeming metropolis of Chicago, and in my eyes, Boston is whirling in a cosmopolitan teacup, cramming all of its joys and problems and sins into a small space, daring to call itself the hub and straining to compete with the big guys. It can be a beautiful city when the light is right, but it can also be ugly and possessive and less than gracious. In other words, it's everything a real city is. I came to Boston to be a reporter. In one way or another, I've been a reporter all my life. I've been blessed, some would say cursed, with a pair of eyes that can see straight through to the bones of something, whether it be a spoiled rock star I've been assigned to interview or a city that suddenly becomes my beat. When a person speaks, I somehow hear a rumble beneath the words. When someone walks, I hear words in the rhythm of their walking. I can see how naked and vulnerable and wildly beating a city's soul is. I know where that soul is kept, and I know that the place is unlocked and that anyone can reach in and scratch and scar what is kept there. When I came here five years ago, the month after Charles Stewart scarred the city's soul and washed himself clean in the river, my reporter's eyes saw straight through to the bones of this city, and I heard them rattle. Originally, my job was what some people would call a frivolous undertaking. I covered music. I went to parties. I wrote about what music I liked and what music I didn't. It was a job a teenager could do. When my husband and I found ourselves at a new Kids on the Block concert, looking like narcotic agents smack dab in the middle of 50,000 screeching, squealing teenagers, I knew there had to be something more. I knew I wanted to stare at the insides of something and then lay it out for judgment and inspection. I wanted people to feel one way when they begin reading my words and another way when they finish. I no longer wanted Charlton Heston or Michael Jackson or Michael Bolton and Oriana Falaci or even Toni Morrison with her booming voice and masterful eyes. I wanted a whole city. I wanted ordinary people with extraordinary voices. I wanted to stamp my signature on the everyday world we live in, the one with potholes and murders and endless winters and piles of doggy doo on the sidewalk. I wanted to wrap a city around me long enough to absorb it and lend it my own bones. And in a lot of ways, Boston is the perfect city for me. It's spoiled and smug and segmented and joyous and giving and sparkling.
It has an attitude because it has history, which is pretty much the same reason we all have attitude. We see the face of that history every day in the pinched noses of women hurtling into town on the train from Brookline. We see it in the entrepreneurs selling the best shoe shine on the East Coast. We see the face of history in the face of everyone who has invested in this city, everyone who believes that the country is here and thriving because Boston wills it so. It is an insufferable attitude that many people label pride. To someone from outside these walls, this sole possession of history is evident in a haughtiness that can barely be tolerated. It is intriguing for precisely that reason. Because it, was, it is responsible for the country, the hub must always shine its best face toward us all. It must be polished and perfect in a place that anyone in their right mind would want to live. I remember being on a plane flying in from Italy and seeing a pro promotional video meant to welcome foreigners to this strange, joyous, and giving new world called Boston. There were bright sunny shots of people jogging along the Charles, looking pensive in Harvard Square, shopping in downtown crossing, people just generally looking important and fulfilled and happy as all get out to be living in such an exquisite gem of a city. But in the entire video, which went on for at least 10 minutes, there was not one black face, not one Latino face, not one Asian, even in the brief glimpse of the city's Chinatown area. I learned early on when I took my first look at Boston's bones that this is the way the city shines its best face. It scrubs that face raw, mistakes that for cleanliness, and turns that face toward the rest of the world. But Boston has its secrets. It has crevices and closets and unexplored corners where people live and die and work and laugh and read newspapers and eat too much and fart and dance and scratch their privates. These people have bones too. They have voices. And their voices are loud and clear and forceful and they sing a song I love listening to. These are the people who taught me what Boston really is, the people who pulled me into their circle of arms and taught me the many ways to call this strange, tiny city a home. One of the city's loudest secrets, one that is almost invisible simply because it is everywhere, is one of the first things I learned. I hadn't been in Boston six months before I was called a nigger, and three months after the first time, it happened again. Now, I've been black every one of my 40 years, and that only happened once before when I was a kid spending a summer on a farm in the Midwest. I expected it then. But Boston slapped me with it twice, and my head reeled, and anger and shame rose up in me, and I realized that this is part of what it means to live here. This is the invisible everything, the nowhere everywhere, an experience most people in this room will never have, will never see happen. It's a crevice a closet. But I saw my job as, as being to lay it out and to show it to you. So I picked up my pen, and this is a little of what I did. The traffic stopped and I willed my left foot forward, then the right. Once you have been stunned into an action, once your name has been taken away, you begin to exist again in stages. Left foot, right. The curb moved closer. People in my line of vision became living, breathing things again. Then I released the breath I'd been holding where it whispered visibly in the chill air. I kept on walking. Just as I glanced in the rearview mirror with an inexplicable need to search the eyes of my detractor, I wondered if he felt a need to know what effect his word had had on me. I am sure that he and others of his ilk with more spite than spine imagined the word a crushing blow, a slap in the face, a booted foot moving down on the ribcage. It is a slight design to hold us down, hold us back, hold us in place, beneath, under, below. It is a nasty word that hisses almost audibly, and yes, it fills the chest with a staccato thudding that is slow to subside. I'm sure the man behind the wheel of that van wanted me to feel less than human. Driver, I never stopped feeling human. But here's what your two bitter syllables accomplished. They made me want to reach into that van, into that dark window, into you, and pull out the shriveled fist that passes for your heart. For a moment that flashed like white light, those words made me hate you. But then, left foot, right. 
They made me lift my head and cross that street with a steely resolve, with a walk that said that you will never deter or defeat me, no matter how many times you spit out the name you've chosen for me. And your venomous word made me do something I knew you would never want me to do. It made me write this. Thank you. That was my entry point into Invisible Boston. And another one came in February 1991, when I wrote a living arts lead story on the anniversary of the assassination of Malcolm X. It was long before Spike Lee's movie, long before anyone had donned the jackets, gym shoes, and caps with the X logo scrawled across the front. I wrote because I felt the need to somehow bring Malcolm back to the standing position, strong and tall and defiant in the face of the city where he was born. I wrote because I call Boston the city of slumped shoulders, where people who are brown walk with their heads down because they feel they have run out of choices. I wrote because I wanted to celebrate the man. What happened startled me. I got calls from people saying there was a picture of Malcolm X about this big, colored picture on the front page of the living arts section. And I got calls from people saying, how did you let the globe give you permission to write a story about Malcolm X? As if I had to be given permission by the predominantly white, predominantly male news organization I worked for before I could write about the life of a black man, even though he was one of the city's own. In letters and on my phone, I heard voices I had never heard before. They were tentative voices, unaccustomed to screaming. They were deep, older voices, a little scratchy as if they hadn't been used in a long time. There were voices saying, we are a community, a life force, a flowing blood, but we feel that we are lost. Working for a newspaper can be a burden as well as an advantage when the newspaper is in a city like Boston. There's always the danger of mistaking the newspaper's face for the city's face. So if you see a front page picture of a young black teen being handcuffed outside of a convenience store, that is what the city becomes. If the only time you see a young Asian woman is when she wobbles beneath an elaborate headdress during a Chinese New Year celebration, that is what the city becomes. If many of the pictures and stories are of young, white, successful men and women enjoying their lucrative jobs, that is what the city becomes. For the invisible community that discovered me just as I discovered them, the city was not them. I remember a day not long before I arrived here as I was trying to negotiate the tea. I heard one young woman scream across the train tracks to another. She was screaming directions to someplace. And she said, if you get to a point where you see all black people, that's Roxbury, you've gone too far. Right? And as if that weren't enough, it's, and you don't want to go there. Now, she was mindful of the fact that there were black people on the platform. It did not matter. This is the attitude of much of the city. Don't discover, don't explore, don't bother to look when there is nothing to see. But that nothing to see is living and breathing, and if you don't ever see, you will not know. And if you do not know this, you know nothing. Some of you may wonder why I call the black community invisible. They're everywhere, you say. I can't go shopping or driving or to work without seeing them. There are millions of them. First of all, there are far fewer blacks than there appear to be. And it is not their presence I speak of, it is their voice. How often have you heard it? And if you are black in this city, how often do you scream it out to be heard? I don't want to make the mistake of screeching out that the black community is the only invisible community in this city. There are people of all colors, ages, styles, and beliefs trapped in the city's crevices. I use the black community as an example first because it is the community I am most familiar with and because it is so visible and invisible at the same time. One of the ways the people who run this world, run this city, run this country, keep us in line is by constantly releasing statistics that make us fearful of the future. 
Whenever we hear one of those statistics, whether it, whether it be the slim chances a woman has of getting married before the age of 30, or the number of young people armed with assault weapons, it makes us more pliable. We are more easily led, easily governed, more willing to hand our lives over to the nearest politician who promises to make things right. Every year, a statistic comes out that says a black male child born in this year, whatever year it is, won't live as long as a white male child born in this year. While this fact seems inevitable, I've heard it almost every year of my life, it is no less sobering. What's more sobering and even insulting is the media's response each and every time they hear that statistic. They grab their pens, their reporters' notebooks and microphones and television cameras, rush into the black community, go up to the first available black man they see and say, how does this make you feel? So in August of 1991, I decided to take my tape recorder and go out and talk to as many black men as possible. Not about dying, not about fear, but simply about their lives. I punched the button on my tape recorder and they talked without being asked questions, without being pressed for answers. For many, it was the first time they'd voiced their opinions about anything. They yelled, cried, and wondered aloud on tape. They took me to school. They pulled me into an invisible Boston and showed me my place there. When I first ventured out for those interviews, I was as naive as someone who lives in Weston or Milton or Wellesley. I didn't know where the heart of the black community was. So I did what someone who lives in Weston or Milton or Wesley would do. I looked in the phone book under Roxbury. I wanted to get an idea of what the community held. When I saw a listing for the Roxbury Men's Club, I visualized a group of professional men, perhaps in the banking or communication industries, who gathered in some air-conditioned conference room, or perhaps the tennis court, to get away from the rigors of the workday world. I visualized a country club with soul, a members-only place where black men could bear their souls, hoist a few, and ease the tensions inherent with living in this city. Such is the problem of visualization. The Roxbury Men's Club was a ragtag, dark and dank little building across the street from a housing project. In essence, it was a pool hall. There were bars on the windows. The men inside were ragged, stooped, suspicious of this young woman who showed up at the front door wanting their lives. The tips of cigarettes swelled with light, whiskey bottles were passed, pool balls clicked in the cool darkness. They would talk to me, they said, but first, I had to play pool. I walked into this invisible place and picked up a pool cue. Little did these guys know that I grew up with a pool table in my basement. After they laughed and marveled and hooted and hollered about my mastery, mastery of the table, they took me downstairs. We sat at a folding table, and they talked, and I listened. If you saw these men on the street, they'd be less than a blip on the landscape. Even they believe that they are old, tired, and inconsequential enough to qualify as background. But they are teachers. They are griots. They are the history the city brags about possessing. If you do not see them, you are living with the wrong eyes. You will not be complete unless you know them. After my third day in the cool recesses of the Roxbury Men's Club, I stepped out onto the sidewalk and directly into the path of a bicycle and a 16-year-old invisible child. He was the opposite of what I was. I grew up in a neighborhood much like Roxbury, but I was coddled and sheltered by my parents. I knew boys like this, raw and edgy and dangerous, but I wasn't allowed near them. So I took in this invisible boy with my eyes, clicked the record button, and sat down at his feet to learn. This is what he taught me. I seen it lots of times, I seen it. Just from being on the street when something was going down, I seen kids get killed, a few. My buddy Jules got bucked. I mean, this gang he was down with, I mean, he wasn't even down with that when he was beefing with this other gang. But one day, it was hot. I remember it was real hot. Somebody called Jules and he opened the window and looked out and they got him in the head. You know, all the time now you got to get him in the head. If you don't get him in the head, most likely they won't die. 
And if they don't die, then you might as well kill yourself, because as soon as they can stand up, they be stopping you big time, man. They'll bust that brain. Then there was Billy. They took him out just for talking stuff, acting like he was down with brothers who didn't even know him, all right? I'm sorry for laughing. I know it's not funny, but I was still looking to see my boys in the hood jiving and scoping the young ladies. But then I saw him at the wake, man, laid out, lying stiff, skin two colors, too light, wearing wigs to hold their heads on, and their mamas clawing at them and screaming out their heads for Jesus. Then I knew Jews and Billy wouldn't be hanging no more. But you know, you just take in the word about somebody dying. It's like, yo, man, somebody got that cat killed last night, man. You know who it was? Oh, not him, man. That's foul. You going to the wake? No, man, ain't going to no wake. I got a game tonight. You know, you just take in the word about somebody dying. You can't let it twist your head up or mess you around, because then, like I said, you might as well kill yourself. Me? I ain't sweating about dying. I'm kicking the right colors, got my brim twisted proper. You know, sometimes it's even fun going out of places most folks are scared of, like down in Dudley late at night. The game is not knowing if you're going to be there when something goes down, and something always does, man. Somebody gets bucked and hits the street, and some folks will say, oh, man, that's too bad. But almost everybody else will say, did you see that guy get shot? That was live, man. Did you see how he ran, how he fell, how he screamed like a girl? They got him in the head, man. They busted that brain. It was like the movies, man. He screamed like a girl. That's what he taught me. Do you hear the fear in that young voice? Can you see him fidgeting inside his black hooded sweatshirt, struggling to be bigger than he is? You got to shoot him in the head, he told me. And that led me to Floyd Williams, an undertaker in Dorchester, another invisible man. He told me that he was tired of burying young men, tired of the gunshots and the screams, tired of no one seen. I asked him what he had to do when he received a body for burial where there'd been a bullet wound to the head. And once he told me, I wanted his voice everywhere, on the tape, in the news story, lurking inside a poem, and now here so that you may see him and hear him. When a bullet enters the brain, the head explodes. I can think of no softer warning for the young mothers who sit doubled before my desk, nodding their smooth brown hands and begging, fix my boy, fix my boy. Here's his high school picture. And a mildly mustachioed player in the crinkled snapshot looks nothing like the plastic bag of boy stored and dated in the cold room downstairs. In the picture, he is cocky and chiseled, clutching the world by the balls. I know the look. Now he is flaps of cheek, slivers of jawbone, assorted teeth, a surprised eye, bloody tufts of naptea, the building blocks of my business. So I turn the photo face down to talk numbers instead. The high price of miracles startles the young mother, but she is prepared. I know that she has sold everything she owns, that cousins and uncles have emptied their empty bank accounts, that she dreams of her baby in tuxedo satin, flawless, in an open casket, across a blood red rose tacked to his fingers, his halo set at a cocky angle. So I write a figure on a piece of paper and push it across to her. She stares at the number. Jesus. But Jesus isn't on my payroll. I work alone until the dim insistence of mourning, gluing, stitching, creating a chin with a brush stroke. I plump shattered skulls, then paint the skin to suggest warmth and impending breath. I plop glass eyes into rigid sockets, then carve eyelids and a forearm, an inner thigh. I reach into collapsed cavities to rescue a tongue, an ear. Lips are never easy to recreate. And I try not to remember the stories, the tales the mothers must tell me to ease their own hearts. Oh, they cry, my Ronnie, my Michael, my David, my Chico. He was on his way home, a dark car slowed down. They must have thought he was someone else. At a party, he sat between two gang members. Really, he was trying to get off the streets. He was trying to pull away from the crowd. He was just in the wrong place at the wrong time. Fix my boy. He was a good boy. Make him the way he was. 
but I have explored the jagged gaps in the boy's body, and I have soothed the angry edges of bullet holes. I have touched him in places no mother knows, and I have birthed his new face. I know he believed himself invincible, that he most likely hissed before the bullets lifted him off his feet. I try not to remember his swagger, his lizard-lidded gaze, his young mother screaming into the phone. She says that she will find the money to bury him. And I know that is the truth that fuels her, forces her to place one foot in front of the other. Suddenly, I want to take her down to the chilly room, open the bag, and shake its terrible bounty onto the gleaming steel table. I want her to see him, to touch him, to press her lips to the flap of cheek because the woman needs to wither. Finally, I move on. We both jump as the phone rattles in its hook. I pray it's my wife, a bill collector, a wrong number, but the wide questioning silence on the other end is too familiar. It's another mother needing a miracle. It's another homeboy coming home. When I heard very graphically the invisible voice of the invisible man, Floyd Williams, I felt after I'd finished the news story that I wanted to pour that voice into that poem, and I want you to hear him today. When I got a chance to tell ordinary people that I was going to be in front of a room full of people, I asked, what would you like me to say to them? I want to give you an audience. Lin, a 19-year-old dishwasher in a Chinese restaurant on Tyler Street, said, just because my voice is slow does not mean that the words are wrong. She is slight and mildly pretty. If you were sitting across from her, you would not see her. Willie is 54, and he sells the globe at the Ruggles Tea Stop. He says, tell those white folks, they're going to be white folks there, right? Tell them not to be looking all crazy when they walk through my neighborhood. Nobody wants their purse or their wallet, so don't tighten your butt up when you come through here. Donna is 21, white, a welfare mother with a three-year-old son. She lives in Hyde Park. She says, tell them I'm going to make it, that I found a new apartment and it's going to be mine. Dorothy, the grandmother of Jermaine Goffigan, a nine-year-old shot and killed in crossfire on Halloween years ago, tell everybody to remember my grandbaby and to pray for me. Rosa and Juan Sanchez, Jamaica Plain. They want you to know that they both work and that their son, Daniel, got an A in English. Thank you. <laughs> Mark is 26, a student at BU. He says, preach our history. Even, even something as simple as a photograph has both black and white. These are just a few residents of the invisible city. What I wanted to do here today was bring more of that city into this room. I wanted to put fat and skin and muscle on its bones and have it stand proud and tall for you. I wanted to fill the empty air with its presence and its people and turn the light to the invisible side. It's a soft light. It is not my intention to shock you or pull you into a city you'd rather not explore, although that's exactly what I want to do. I want you to have the guts to explore that invisible city willingly. It is part of this smug, snooty, glorious, and difficult city called Boston. It is populated by brown people, yellow people, and white people who scream, cry, curse, make love, who burn their dinners, hate their bosses, people who look into mirrors and hardly ever see themselves. Perhaps now they are more than air to you, more than shapes who drift past you on the street. As they take on bone and breath, there is no reason to fear them. For I come from that city, the no place inhabited by no one, and you see that I am everyone and that all of you are me. Thank you. Thank you.
Well, I hope she doesn't leave you speechless, too. Um, now Patricia Smith will take your questions. If you have a question, you may come up to the microphone in the middle. Uh, we'd like to ask you not to touch the microphone as we are recording this. So please begin lining up. Um, and as the moderator, I'll take the liberty of asking the first question while people are trying to think of what they could possibly come up with that could be as well articulated as, as your talk. Um, what do you think about the possible rollback in um, integrating the schools in Boston? What I said before about this, oh, I'm sorry, what I said before about this kind of being a city of slumped shoulders. Can you hear her? Can you, you can't hear me? Okay. Now can you hear me? Um, what I said before about this being a city of slump shoulders, um, I guess what frightens me about that is that I already hear so many people saying, well, it was inevitable, and that's just the way, that's just the way things are gonna go, and there's no fight in their voices when they say it, and there's, no, there's not even that much um, uh, regret, you know? And that's on the part of, uh, you know, for both minority community and the white community. I just, I don't see it. And so I think um, it's, a, it's a spark plug for rage, it needs to be because we're nowhere near where we need to be on that. And it's obvious if you just go in and look at the schools. So in, just to accept that as just the way things are gonna be is, is ludicrous. Yes. Um, I'm sure you've been in like establishment journalism for a while now. Do you think the climate's any different, any more welcoming for uh, different viewpoints than it was okay. maybe when you, you know started? what is, your voice is ringing a little bit. I heard what you Should said about being back, in the or? establishment of ver journalism. Yeah, I, I know that you've been in establishment journalism for a while. Do you uh -huh. think that the climate is any more accepting or welcoming? Is the, is the climate in, in this journalism established more mm -hmm. accepting? Or, no. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's, it's not. Uh, there was a real, I, I'm not even sure what sparked it, but there was a real turning of corners, and a lot of it had to do with the affirmative action debate. Uh, there's a lot less, less tolerance in the newsroom. I mean, first of all, the numbers in the newsroom are, continue to be low. They don't mirror the population at all. Um, and now it's, it's kind of, like, personally, I get a lot of flack because there are people who sit at their desk and grumble that I got my job because I'm a black female. Now, I know personally that I put a lot of work into my columns and that, you know, I feel good about the way that they're written and reported. So I don't, I don't have any stake in that. I mean, I just don't believe it, but that doesn't keep the grumbling from going on. So before, you know, at the beginnings of integration where there was this kind of, at least on the surface, this we are the world mentality thing, they don't even bother to put the front up anymore. You know, so it, you feel, you tend to feel pretty isolated in the newsroom. Good evening. You're a breath of fresh air. Thank you very I must much. Say. <laughs> Unfortunately, most of the people who are here don't need to hear what you've said. The folks that need to hear what you have said are not here. And of course, your, your column speaks to that. One of the things that you sort of alluded to, but you didn't really speak on, was institutional racism. I think one of the problems with white America, most white Americans do not feel that they're racist. They don't understand how they can be called or considered institutional racism. And you might want to talk a little bit how black people or Afro-Americans perceive institutional racism and how it affects us as human beings given the fact that we are, we are also Americans. Mm -hmm. A lot of us don't, a lot of people don't look at us as Americans. Every person in this life doesn't that, look the same. Sir, is that your question? You wanted to speak yes. to that? Mm -hmm. okay. Uh, okay, well, there I are... have another question, but I'll wait. Okay. Now, I'm sure you know that um, we, we do live dual lives, okay? One of the things that, that uh, illustrates this to me if I'm at work and the phone rings, I can be talking to someone just the way I'm talking to you right now. The phone rings and it's my mom. 
And all of a sudden, I'm like, oh yeah, I'm already, you know, and, and it's, it's this whole other person. It's not, a conscious, it's not a conscious switch. But that goes on in all phases of, of, you know, the corporate world. It's like by the time you get out of your car, it's like, take this deep breath. This is, what, this is how I behave. This is how I act. This is how I speak to this person. This is what I do. This is why this person who's walking down the hall at me right now spoke to me yesterday but's not speaking to me today because I did something or said something that reminds them that I'm black. You know? And the reason I wrote that column that I did, I, w I didn't have a column when um, that racial incident happened that I, I spoke about before, but I had a space on the op-ed page, is because I think that, that especially institutional racism, is, is kind of a casual discussion topic, but it's not seen as something that affects real people, that we take home with us and we take to our families and our families feel. You know? So I wanted to say, this one incident and this one word, this is what, how it changed my whole day. This is the changes it took me through and how it made me feel. And um, I, what I try to do in the column is things that, that we've learned to live with. Um, you know, I mean, going to, when I was a concert reviewer, I would go to a concert and there would be someone white and me and, and the white person would have a bag exactly like mine and they would breeze through and, I, and they would stop me. You know, or I would walk in the room and feel like the whole climate of the room change and people come up to you and say, who are you? What are you doing here? Do you have a pass? And you know, there's six people on you. Then you say you're from the globe and then all of a sudden you're wearing your company in front of you and you're fine. You know, and most, you know, you, you normally don't think about that, but then when you do, it's like, wait a minute, I wasn't legitimate until you found out that I worked for a white news organization. And then everyone's putting out the red carpet for you, you know, and it's, it's things like that. It's having to, to switch and put on that other face and, and wear those other clothes, and it does take a toll. And I try to tell people in the column in a number of ways that this is the toll it's taking, and you should stop and think about that. Uh, Madam Moderator, I have to say something to you because I'm a very outspoken person. I would suggest that uh, persons like myself who have a lot of experience both in the business world and in the human world, when we lead up to a question, we have a reason for leading up the way that we do. And although there are not a lot of people standing here waiting to ask questions, you ought to allow us to have a few moments. I would suggest that you do that and Certainly. consider that in the future. Getting back to you, Patricia Smith. <laughs> uh, you recently have written three articles about racism and problems at the MBTA. And they sent you here to get me? No. <laughs> uh, I happen to agree with the things that you wrote in the article, because I don't mind saying in the public that I work for the MBTA. And I'm a manager there, and the things that you've said are true in your articles. The unfortunate thing, not enough people have come forward to bring the stories that really happened at the MBTA. Mm -hmm. We have approximately 6,700 employees there. And the MBTA has always been a closed club. You had to know somebody mm -hmm. or have right. a godfather or a godmother to get a job at the MBTA, no matter what your credentials were. And you indicated one thing, and I want to just comment on this, Madam Moderator is that you have to be better than the people, the other people that work at the, at the Globe in order to keep your job. Mm -hmm. We all feel that way in any environment that we work in, that we have to be better than everybody else there. Why is that? It should not be. We are still Americans, I have to say that. I would encourage you to continue to turn over the stones and pull the covers off the people at the MBTA who practice institutional racism. Mm -hmm. We have a new general manager there. His heart and head seems to be in the right place, but he's up in the ivory tire, tower, and most of us are in the trenches. And the people in the ivory tower don't always see, or always pay attention to what's happening in the trenches. Mm -hmm. And as a result of those three articles, Madam Moderator, things have changed already. <laughs> One. Some people who got laid off, that were people of color, a few weeks ago, they're back to work. I wonder why. <laughs> I would encourage you to continue your good works. Read tomorrow. In the, ex <laughs> the expertise that you have developed, 
you need to speak on it a little bit louder and a little bit clearer because what you have shared with us here tonight is just the tip of the iceberg. Mm -hmm. You have shared with us a lot of what, who you are, what you have, and what you're offering to us. And I ask you to continue to do that. And if you wish to make any comment of further about the MBTA, and if you need another source who's willing to stand up mm -hmm. and be a godfather, just look at me and I'm, I'll be glad I'm to get my name I'm headed straight for you as soon as I come down here. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, can, you, can you hear me? Yes, go ahead. Okay. Uh, you've talked with, uh, with great obvious eloquence about um, what it's like to be a black person in a, in a white-controlled world. You also are a woman in a male-controlled world. Uh, did you, is that a less intense or lower on your order of priorities, or is it just because that's the subject of your next talk to the forum? <laughs> um, did you hear him? Is talking about uh, being a, a woman in a male-dominated world, and if that was less intense than being a black in a white-dominated world. Um, hmm. I I think it's. I, I think that when I when I walk into that that white male world, I'm probably looked at as a black first. Okay. And then, I, and then we click down a layer, and then it's, my God, not only is she black, but she's a black female, you know? Um, there, there are issues, I mean, I, I recently had a, um, a discussion with Eileen McNamara, who's, who's another one of the Metro columnists, a white woman, and we just started to investigate the many ways that the, the hierarchy that is in the Boston Globe keeps us apart. You know, they, they classify Eileen as, a, you know, white mother of young children. So that's basically what her beat should be, you know. And I should be on the urban thing. I mean, they don't, they don't say this, but, but you can see they kind, of, they kind of polarize us that way. So we're starting to come together as women, regardless of, of color. Uh, I'm seeing a lot, of, a lot of ways, well, you know, just, just have the, the little ladies come in here so we can talk to them thing. Uh, with, with me and Eileen, and so we're, we're bonding that way. Um, but most of the, the issues that I've had, I've never really had an issue or a problem with someone who didn't deal with me correctly as a woman. Um, then there's, you know, some of the calls I got when we're talking about the, the tea columns, some of the, the hate, the people who call me up on my voicemail, and I visualize these guys coming home and sitting in their underwear in their barca loungers, you know, with a six pack, going, let's call Patricia Smith, all right? Um, but a lot, of, a lot of the stuff starts out saying, uh, you know, stay away from the tea story and, and so on and so forth. But then right away, it turns sexual. It t you know, stay away from the tea story is one thing, you know, or we're going to put a gag on you or something, that's another thing. Or we're going to run you over with a bus, that's another thing. But then when they say, well, first, we're going to rape you in the back of the bus. And, you know, so it's kind of all kinds of things, being black, being female, all that come into play with that. And that's tangled up more in the, in the readers, in some of the readers' heads than it is in mine. Okay, I mean, I, right now, the more I do the column and the more I get out and talk to people, I have, I'm getting a clearer and clearer picture of who I am and what's most important to me. And by considering and nurturing what's important to me, I can do my best job at writing for other people. You know, so I, I think it, it is less intense, but because I've always felt that I was black first before anything else, it's something that I didn't pay that much attention to, and now I'm beginning to form um, a kind of tentative alliance with white women, which is something I never thought of before, that, that we are fighting a lot of the same battles and I shouldn't dismiss a woman I shouldn't dismiss a woman because she is not my color, because she has battles that are common. You know, so I'm, I'm starting to explore that more. And it took me a while, but you know, even the black culture in a lot of ways is very male dominated. Yes, sir. I remember listening to your bio at the start, and you know, you, now you're working at the Globe, and before that, you worked at the, the Sun Times in Chicago. Okay. Those are two real media giants, and a lot of the big media nowadays is losing 
viewers, the TV nightly newscasts, and circulation is down at a lot of the, the big city newspapers. Why do you think that is, and do you think there's a connection between how hard it is for the disenfranchised in any city to really find a voice in these big outlets, and do you think there's a connection there? Hmm. I do think that uh, people tend to, will tend to lose interest if they keep reading the paper and there's nothing that mirrors the life that they're leading. You know, I think that's a real problem. Um, I don't know. It, it seems like the guys have a, a really difficult time. They meet all the time. So, you know, two less people bought the newspaper today, and, and let's jump on this new media thing, and we've got a television studio now in the globe, you know, so they're trying to keep ahead and jump on all that stuff. But for the huge news organizations are very good at taking marketing surveys and saying, here's who's reading our paper, here's who's... And every time they do, they realize that they're not being read very much in, in communities of color. Now, that would seem to translate that we must not be writing what they want to read. But it might reach that point, but then when it comes to, to, to turning that into action, it's a wall, and I don't, I'm not really sure why that's there. I don't know why when a medical writer is doing a medical story and they need a, an expert opinion, they look for, for some white guy from Harvard Medical School and they quote him, instead of finding a black guy who may be just at the same level or, you know, I mean, just common things. We want to see our faces all, and our, hear our voices all throughout the paper, not just when it's a black story, you know. Um, not just, you know, flick, clicking our pictures at some society gala to say, okay, now we've covered the other side, you know. Um, and I think until the newspapers, I mean, they might have to be jolted. The circulation might have to go way down. Do you think that's going to happen? Some of the, the guns or journalism out there is starting to to make its impact. Well, I, you know, I, but I don't, I don't think it's going to be a big dramatic thing. I mean, I, I, that might take, be what it takes to get them to sit up and take notice. But it, it always tends, somehow, readership always tends to even out. It'll drop off in one place and pick up in another. Uh, if it's a, a year where there's a lot of, of um, big news stories, it goes way up, and then when it's not so much, it goes down, you know. So it's, it's, it's not just that, but uh, I think, judging by a lot of forums and conferences and stuff that I've been to, that the editors are starting to take, they're really starting to take notice of that. I'm a pretty faithful reader of your column, especially your uh, Bernie Getz column about a week ago, especially number six. Is, is Bernie here yet? No. <laughs> um, okay, thank you. Thank you. Ooh. Uh, two quick questions and hopefully with longer answers than the questions. Uh, First is, have you seen any changes in the newsroom since another white corporation took over uh, the New York Times? And let me let me do that, and then you know, okay. okay. Have I seen any change in the newsroom since, as he put it, another white corporation took over uh, the New York Times? Um, no, because part of the it, it was funny to watch, because when the word came down that we were bought by the New York Times. Uh, you could see editors in these meetings like poring over old editions of the Times, right? And thinking they're going to make the changes that they think the Times is going to ask us to make. And this is just in the style of the newspaper and stuff. But one of the agreements was that for five years after takeover, they couldn't make changes. They couldn't come and sweep through the newsroom and dismiss people and lay off people. And, you know, so everything's been very calm and pretty much the same. Now, I don't know what's going to happen at the end of that five year period. You know, but, uh, but no, uh, any change that I've seen in the newsroom has not been because of the New York Times. Second is, um, have any of your editors ever pulled one of your stories or, con or columns because of uh, its controversy? Has any of my, have any of my editors ever pulled a story or column because of controversy? No. One, one, of the, one of the agreements, and wouldn't we all like to have this agreement on the job, they, they're not supposed to be able to change anything I write. They can't tell me what to write about, and then once I've written it, they can't change it. I was just on the phone in the green room. Uh, one of my uh, uh, T contacts was talking about the, the uh, affirmative action office at the T, and he said, it's as useless as tits on a bull. Well, I thought that was extremely colorful. 
<laughs> and I put it in, you know, and, and one of the editors said, well, I think we should, we should drop, you know, it was, it was the end of a long quote. He said, I think we should drop that, you know. And I said, I got on the phone, I'm getting my dander up lately, and I said, no, do not do it. Then it winds up that when another editor brought it to his attention, he didn't tell him that it was in my column, and they, did, they thought maybe it was a quote from a news story or something, and they said, oh, it's Patricia's column, let it go. You know, so basically what that translates to is, let her hang out there to dry, okay? It's like when I write something like that, I'm out on that limb, they're basically not, that's, that's the nature of columnizing, you know? But uh, no, they've never pulled anything. We've had, we've had disagreements, um, but uh, no. And, and there have been times when I've written things where I could tell they, they're kind of, are you sure you want to say that that way? Yeah. But they, they, haven't, they haven't pulled anything. Yes, sir. Hi, uh, thanks for speaking. A um, couple of points. One is that uh, on June 1st, Marion Wright Edelman in Washington, D.C. will be having a uh, stand, for, stand children. for children. And I wanted to know if you're going to be speaking there. If not, why not? You wonder if I'm going to be speaking there? Right. There, there was, um, there's a group going from a school. I can't think of the school right now. But they called me and they said, we will buy you a ticket if you come with us. Um, and the reason I can't do that is on June 1st, I have to be in uh, New Hampshire to do a, a, a workshop that I signed up for a while ago. That's what that is. Um, it, it was a very intriguing proposition. I would have loved to have done that. And, uh, and I do promise that that week I will write about children. Um, I actually think, I'm think I'm gonna try to get together with some of the kids who are going and, and talk to them. But thank you very much for, for saying that. I would love to be there. I just can't do it this time. Next time. And the second thing is, is that, um, do you do any programs with the youth in the cities of Boston at all? Because I think that some of them could stand to hear your voice. Uh, programs colors. with youth in the city of Boston. Um, yeah, I go, I go into schools. I mean, it's, it, and it pretty much depends on what the administration calls me in to do. Sometimes it's a poetry reading. Sometimes it's to talk about my job. Sometimes it's a mixture of the two, how the two intersect. Um, I do do that. Uh, unfortunately, my, my, my biggest residency thing that I do is in Miami, and that came, that came yeah, I go into a school in Miami every year. Uh, that came about in kind of a strange way, but I would, I would love to do the same thing in Boston. It'd be easier, it's closer. Uh, I could go in for like one day. So I, when I think that one day I'm going to have a lot of time. One of the things I would like to do is just to put together a package of things that I, I could, because I love kids, and, and I think uh, I love coming in and taking them off guard somehow so they have to sit up and take notice, you know. Um, I would love to just put down a list of things that I, would, I could do and with what grade levels and, and limit myself to X amount of those a year, but to go in and instead of that one drop um, one hour thing is to come in over a two or three day period and, and actually sit down and let's roll our sleeves up and produce something with them. So, um, yeah, I, I would, you know, are you, do you by any chance work at a school? No. no. Not at the time period, no. Oh, okay. okay. Yeah, yeah, I do do that. You're welcome. Thank you. Hi. Hi. I wondered if you could um, compare or contrast what you see would be the problems with racism and classism. Huh, racism and classism. Well, it's, it's funny, one of the first columns that I did here, remember that, remember that Four Seasons fiasco where the, the, guy, the guy came in and said he didn't want any gay people serving him food or something? And, and they, of course, just like cleared the place of everybody because he, was, he had lots of money, you know? And unfortunately, there are instances when, when People in Boston scream racism because they're so used to it and it's not really racism, but it is classism. And that was, a, you know, I was ready to jump right on the bandwagon and say, oh, this is racist. But then more I looked into it, it's like, I think I put in the column that, you know, if, um, God, what was it? Oh, if a black man had come in there with a duffel bag full of money and wanted the, the you know, head of the hotel to like bray like a donkey, in the public garden for three hours, we'd be hearing them right now, 
you know, it, it, you know and, and on some levels, because Boston is so kind of steeped in that, who are you, who's your mama? You know, who's your daddy, what's that job? You know, where do you work type thing? You know, that in a lot of instances, I have to stop and say, you know, is this indeed a case of racial discrimination or is it just money talks or doesn't talk? So in a lot of ways, in the way it manifests itself and the way it looks outwardly, there isn't a difference. There really is, especially here. I think in, in, it would be different in probably in some other towns. But here, it's, it's really a big deal. I mean, when I first came here, it's really difficult to get to know Bostonians if you have no prior history here. And then once you establish some sort of history, it's like, okay, where do you live? What's your house look like? What circles do you travel in? Stuff like that, you know. And outwardly, it looks, it looks the same as, it's a little more subtle in a lot of ways than racism. But it looks the same outwardly. Uh-huh, you're welcome. I find your writing exquisite as well as powerful and insightful. Thank you and very thank much. You for it. I'm curious if you see anything hopeful on the political scene locally, statewide, or nationally in terms of, in terms of race, in terms of race, <laughs> race issues or anything else if you like talking about? Locally, no. <laughs> statewide, no. Um, locally, it, it, it's interesting. Uh, I come from a city that has a very, very strong black political base. Okay, and not only are, are black people there in numbers, but they have some backbone in city government. Um, I come from a city where there was a black mayor. So I know that black, you know, that cities do thrive under the leadership of actual black folks. Yeah. Uh, I don't see anything anything on the horizon in Boston that shows that, that the black communities will ever have any political backbone. And that's, that's, that's very, um, it's a very discouraging thing to say, but uh, from my perch right now, I don't see it. And part of that might be that I'm an outsider. Maybe if I was, you know, maybe if I came up here, I could see the winds of change or something, but, but I, I honestly don't. Um, it took me an awful long time to become interested in Massachusetts politics. Um, I'm used to more colorful characters. I'm, well, actually, there's enough graft, you know, I should be um, feeling right at home. <laughs> but I, you know, I honestly, when you get right down to it, Carrier Weld, I could care less. You know, a lot of, a lot of what I, I need to see addressed, neither one of them are addressing, and it seems like when the issue, any, any issue of race uh, or racial imbalance is brought up, they kind of scurry to their corners and don't come out again until we're talking about something that they can deal with. Um, nationally, what a joke, huh? Um, in terms of race, I think it's, it's, it's a, I think it's a, a, a hot word for Clinton. I think it's a, a non-word for Dole. I, I just, you know, it's, it's just not going to happen. It's not going to be an, a debatable issue in this election um, unless Dole uses it to say that, that Clinton is wishy-washy on race. And, and hopefully that, thinking that that will work in his favor. But uh, other than that, uh, what I'm most concerned about is, uh, because of what I do, what I'm most concerned about is locally. And, uh, and I don't see any, any uh, light on the horizon there. What are your reactions, since you are from Illinois, to Carol Mosley Brown after, what is it, two years or f two years, I think, or is it What's four? my reaction to her? Yeah. I'll tell you the truth, I haven't followed her that much since I've left. I, I did a thing where um, I did a bus tour of Southern Illinois with, Southern Illinois with her when she was running, uh, trying to do a story about that phenomena of being the first. Every time they talked about her, they said, the first black woman to, the first black, you know, and, and to see how she felt about that, you know. Um, she seems to be very strong. I mean, you know, she's holding her own. She's refusing to back down. She told me this wonderful story about being in an elevator with Jesse Helms, you know, and, and <laughs> And him kind of chomping on his gum and talking about, you know, um, um, oh, you know, and there's that new colored gal, you know. 
and and she you know would stand right up to him and do this so you know and and that's the kind of day to day thing that I would worry about you know I'm more concerned with that than I am her whole policy making record and all that but uh, she's going to be there she's going to be there and I don't think she's as I don't think she's as vocal as as I had hoped she would be at the beginning I I think she's she's a little retiring more retiring than I thought she's strong but she's strong in the undercurrent you know so hopefully she'll find a little bit more of her voice. Thanks. Sure. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen, and join me in thanking Patricia Smith. Ooh. Uh-oh. Oh. Uh, I, one more question, and then the cameras turn off. It took me about half an hour to come up here, so that's why <laughs> I didn't want to stop coming up. Um, thank you very much. Um, I love your writing, and thank you. you make my heart beat when you oh, write. thank and you so much. I love, I love hearing you talk. I just wanted to ask, in terms of I lived in Chicago and I worked on the West Side and I've read your poetry about Madison Street and it's, I love it. Don't you think that unfortunately Boston is an American city in terms that the, well, after traveling around, the things that you write about here are everywhere? Don't I think Boston is an American city because the things that I write about are, are everywhere? Yeah. Um, um, that, this is something that I, I just I see the same things where I go. Um, mm -hmm. I'm not from here. And also because I'm not from here, I wanted to ask you, do you consider yourself American? And what is your definition of an American? <laughs> you don't. Good last question, huh? Mm -hmm. uh, Thanks. First like of all, first of all, uh, do I consider Boston an American city? It is probably very much an American city. Speaking as someone who's been on a couple of road trips across the country and realized that um, this might be your heartland, but it's not mine, you know. Um, and, and, you know, having a, going into a restaurant in Elk City, Oklahoma, and having everybody shut up because a black person's in the room, you know. It, it's, and it happens, there's, there's segregation and problems in Chicago. I'm not saying Chicago is, is, is perfect. Um, the, the problem as I see it was well, not really a problem. I, my job is to write specifically about this city and what makes this city, um, what's unique about the way Boston faces its problems, okay? Uh, and what's aggravating is that there are so many people here that accept intolerance and think it is Boston's right to be that way. You know, it's that whole, you know, um, cradle of liberty type thing, you know. Well, this is where, this is where the country began, so of course, you know. Um, and it's the same thing when I'm, when I'm doing something on agency. Someone who, um, someone from the MBTA called me and said, well, of course the MBTA is racist because so's the city. Okay, so I'm supposed to stop now? I'm supposed to say, oh, okay then, I'll just go on and write about this, you know, this new koala bear at the zoo or something. Um, so yeah, I mean, it is an American city, but uh, that doesn't excuse it for being wrong when it's wrong, and, and I intend to write about that. Do I consider myself an American? Um, yes, I, 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 have, I have no other real, rooted, deep knowledge of any other place. Okay, I consider myself an African American. I consider myself more of an African American, having visited Africa, and and having you know I, I covered the elections in '94 for the Globe, and to have people come up to me who I did not know and did not know me and say welcome home. Okay, so I I consider myself an Af, but I have to say American because when I look at my mother and father, their their experiences in leaving the South taking a bus up to the north, getting factory jobs, you know, uniquely American experiences. You know, immigrants have done that. The whole thing, you know, and it's very much a, you know, come to America, this is what you do. And so that's how I was raised. So I can't say, oh no, this country has nothing to do with me, but I do think it's, um, it's a responsibility of mine now if I'm going to embrace the country to be willing to do whatever it is I need to do to change it. You know, and that's part of kind of what fuels my writing. If I go to Africa, I feel perfectly fine con calling myself an African. If I come home, you know, because of, of what I live with and, and, and what lives with me or whatever, um, I will put that hyphen and I'll be an African American. That's fine with me. I don't, I'm not really into that. Uh, categorizing me does not explain me. 
you know. When I do, sometimes when I do poetry and someone says, um, oh, Patricia Smith, what kind of poet is she? Is she a black poet? Is she a black female poet? Is she a feminist poet? Is she a black feminist poet? Is she, you know? So it's, it's like, they need to, there's a real need to categorize you right away. And I sort of, I rebel against that. So, you know, if someone actually needs a label and they want to use African American, that's fine. If, as one nice young man who I interviewed wants to call me, you know, Nigra or whatever, that's, you know, that's his prerogative, you know, as long as he doesn't call it me that in the wrong place with just me and him. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, that's, it, it's not that much of an issue. Thank you very much. This ends our spring series. Come back in the fall.